morning. Good to see you all. As I was working through preparing the message, um, I changed my mind, and I guess I have the prerogative to do that, right? So instead of the verses you see printed in your bulletin, we're going to actually read through James 2, 1 through 13. It's all too important to leave any of it out. So let's look at that together this morning. My brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, must not show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in filthy old clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and saying, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand there or sit on the floor by my feet. Have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my dear brothers and sisters, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor. Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are blaspheming the noble name of him to whom you belong? If you really keep the royal law found in scripture, love your neighbor as yourself. You are doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. For he who said you shall not commit adultery also said you shall not murder. If you do not commit adultery but do commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom, because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. So I see, as I look in the book of James, actually, a foundation of life. And so we're going to be talking through that over the next few months as I come and get the privilege to share with you. But this morning specifically, what I see in this scripture is human worth, a a foundation of life. What is a human worth as we look through this? So, hey, did you see that person over there? What were they wearing and how were they acting? Geez, that makes me feel uncomfortable. Can you believe what they're doing and the decisions they're making in life? You know, that's things that we can get caught up in, the way we see and look at other people. God values each person's life so much that he considers it a law of life or a foundation for life. It makes us as guilty as breaking any of the other laws as murder, adultery, as it mentions in this scripture. If we judge others, if we look upon others differently than the Lord looks upon them. He does not want us to be being unkind, it's as simple as that, to others, having negative thoughts, judging them and taking and talking about them. It's not that he just says don't do it. It's so important he calls it a sin. It's a sin. That tells me it's about as serious as it gets, right? What value do we put on human life, each one of us. You know, it is easy to speak the words of the Bible and say, I know this is what scripture says, or I've been taught this, you know, to love others and don't do against others. But it's another thing to actually live it out, isn't it? You may not actually speak the judgmental words that you think in your head at all, but they just become thoughts. And then those thoughts, when we act upon them, it translates into that judgment that we're saying we should not do. And so we see here simply actions speak louder than words when we think of our actions or following our thoughts. The very first verse here in chapter 2 says, do not show favoritism. We immediately think, why don't do that? But then my thought could go to, well, there was that one time Well, then there was that other time, and oh yeah, I had that thought, and I acted not in such a good way. And then I realized there are those thoughts. If we really think about what we're thinking about, and if we really pay attention to how we are acting in our simple everyday lives, how much judgment maybe there really is in our life towards others. 
Um, we, you know, see a lot on social media these days, <laughs> and a lot in all the news broadcasts we have, you know, at our fingertips. Um, and are we not judging? You know, let us not judge like they are judging, like others that we see. Let us not fall into those traps, because what happens is it becomes a pattern then in our life, very simply, very subtly. Or it can be very overt. You know, we see some really angry people out there these days, don't we? Really going after other people. When we see the shiny things in life, the people with shiny things, we are naturally attracted to them. You know, we don't really want to maybe deal with the people that are not up to the standards that we think. People are shiny to us when they have things of this world, is what we find. Fame and fortune, homes, cars, clothes, jewelry, notoriety. They seem to be shiny. They're shining. They typically receive a lot of attention, and in our humanness, we all want attention. We all love that attention, even if we don't admit it or even realize it. I mean, have you ever met a famous person or who has been considered famous, right? Like, how, how did you act? What was your reactions? You know, what were you willing to do to meet that famous person and even be noticed by them or be seen by them? It reminds me of a story, actually, that I read about a very dirty traveler entering in a church, came right in the church, walked right up the aisle, and sat right down at the front of the church. And it was, um, you know, obviously noticeable how the people in the congregation were looking and gasping and whispering. And, you know, in my mind, in this story, I picture a very long aisle, you know, a big church, and people were watching this very dirty traveler just go right up to the front and make himself at home right there, just sat right down, not even in a pew. And what we see in the story, actually, is um, the way I read the story, and I've read it a couple different ways, but it was the pastor that was dressed up as this traveler, and he just wanted to see the reaction of his congregants and how they would react. And what he saw and what they experienced that morning is a very old gentleman with a cane, one of the congregants came out and came up the aisle and sat down right by the dirty, stinky traveler. You know, when that dirty, stinky traveler enters into our life in different ways, maybe not in our church service, but in our life, in our daily travels, how do we react? Are we going to be the gentleman that came up and sat down beside him and didn't let the stink and the stench bother him? It really is always just WWJD. What would Jesus do? Right? We kind of had that as a slogan many years ago, or armbands, you know, everybody was all about what would Jesus do. But I mean, seriously, what did Jesus do? That's what he did. He hung with those. He did things with those. That's where his focus and attention was, to the point that he got himself discriminated and put down and talked about because of who he hung with. But he was willing to do that because Jesus always did what the Father said to do. And that's what we need to do, especially pay attention to these verses this morning. When we look at the terrible tragedies happening around this world, the mass shootings, grievous acts towards people we can't even fathom, that we can't even really put into words or mention, we see that much, not much value is really being put on human worth these days and how those things happen and we gasp and think, oh my. But what are the little things that we could possibly be doing that really is just as grievous, you know? Our world puts value and worth on many things that don't really matter in the overall scheme of things. Again, we all want to be looked upon with worth. We all want to be shiny. We all want to be seen. I mean, our eyes just go naturally to the shiny. What you take in with your eyes and you process is what you focus on. It becomes your focus, whether you realize it or not. So what filters are you processing things through? Well, as a Christian, everything needs to be filtered through Scripture and what God's Word says and tells us to do. It always comes down to God's way or the world's way. In my research for this message, actually, I read results from a study by Fernanda Sorella, 
uh, in behavioral psychology from the University of Melbourne. It was interesting because it was entitled, Why Are We Attracted to Shiny Things? And what I found in this research that this person did, as human beings, it said we are attracted to shimmery and glossy objects. Diamonds, sparkly lights, glitter, even glossy lipsticks, right ladies? It might seem like shine and gloss is attractive because it represents a luxurious lifestyle or because we tend to be attracted to beautiful things. But is this really the reason? Research was done to understand if there was a deeper rooted reason for this attraction to all things that shimmer and shine. So to find a biological explanation, there were experiments done, conducted, on the attraction of this glossiness in humans, and it discovered something quite fascinating, actually. The study considers three reasons for the preference, people's preference to the shiny things. It took into consideration socialization, just simply beauty itself, and water. That's kind of what caught my eye why I kept reading the article. I was like, in water. Okay, so let's see what this says. Glossy and shiny is associated with objects of wealth and luxury. This is demonstrated through the socialization of human beings. So when we see, you know, as we're growing up, there's media, there's marketing that really targets us as human beings to like those things. When you watch commercials, when you see how things are advertised in the stores to us, right, it all shines. I mean, they even use special lighting and special ways they, you know, adjust things just so it gets our attention, right? But that said, with that said, you know, the, the dazzling things that we are attracted to, and when we're looking at socialization and how it's used by the media and marketing, it said, but that doesn't explain why children would be attracted because children have not yet been socialized to the point that adults have been, and they haven't yet fallen into that trap or that way of thinking. So then the second reason would be the attraction to beautiful things simply based on what is beautiful is good. That we correlate that in our minds. Whatever we perceive as beautiful is a good thing, right? So the hypothesis and how appealing products have higher attraction for customers and get more easily selected because of this thought process of beauty. Beauty might be a valid reason as to why we prefer shiny, but it is not clear as to why we find shiny objects beautiful. And so then it goes on to talk about many of the experiments, which I won't go into all of those details. But why the water? Why water? Water is an essential resource for living beings, and humans are naturally drawn to it, drawn to water. In fact, it is so important to our survival that three days without water can lead to death. Water is also essential for our growth and development as a species. That is why when you see where humans have settled throughout time, they settle by bodies of water, rivers, seas, flowing water, lakes, right? Clear and flowing water has been favored among humans through history, given that it presents higher chances of survival than stagnant water with potential harmful bacteria. This clear and flowing water usually has a shiny surface. So right there, I just saw God. Therefore, creating the possibility for humans to be innately attracted to shiny surfaces for survival. Innately. God put it in us. Nothing in the study talked about God or our creator, but I saw him. I'm like, there he is, God. There were te six test groups, actually, in this study. So again, I'm not boring you with all those details, but the experiments proved that there is a preference for glossy, shiny in human beings that stems from our natural need for water. God has put natural needs in us. We have a natural need to be seen, to be known, to be shiny, and then we are attracted to those type of things as well. When we're thinking about human worth and how God has built us and put us together, but it is still in our nature to prefer all things shiny and glossy. So again, this was so interesting to me that in light of God's creation, which of course was not considered or mentioned in this study at all, 71% of Earth's, the Earth's surface is water, and 60% of our bodies is made up of water. So can you make this connection of how God created things and the value 
he put on water. The value he put on human worth. Water is shiny and beautiful, and I personally, you can ask my husband Jim, any water. I love sitting by a creek. I love the ocean. is my ultimate place in life. A lake. I mean, you give me a body, you know, body of water, and I'm there. It's like this is so soothing and just so calming, right? So it really is all about God, and it was really funny, too, as I was reading that study and putting my notes together for this morning. I literally was extremely thirsty. I think I got up three times and went and got a bottle of water. So, you know, even just the power of suggestion, right? Shiny things are not bad. It's the value or the worth that we put on them. So what happens when we see the other side of the coin? When things are not so shiny, when they're down and out with not many material possessions, no one knows them, even to the point of dirty and stinky. Our eyes want to dart away and our body follows. We don't want to be around things that aren't nice and shiny and attractive to us, right? And then judgment seeps in. Judgment. Actually, I find judgment in both scenarios, in the good and in the bad part of this, right? We make assumptions by appearances on a variety of levels. But what does God judge on? In 1 Samuel 16, 7, but the Lord told him, Samuel, don't think Elab is the one just because he's tall and handsome. He isn't the one I've chosen. People judge others by what they look like, but I judge people by what is in their hearts. They were choosing, right here in Samuel, a person to raise up and to follow. And of course, everybody was looking for the strongest and the best looking or, you know, the outward appearance, like, oh, of course, it's going to be that one. And God said, no, 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 that's not who I've chosen. You know, God judges the inward and he sees the heart. If you think God is the only one that sees your heart, you are wrong. Because what is in our heart is what our actions and our thoughts flow out of. Right? So we talked about our thoughts and our actions follow our thoughts. Well, what is in our heart? It becomes our thoughts. Your actions do show your heart. Actions are like a window to the heart. You can see right through to the real you. So it's our hearts that need to be shiny. So what makes a shiny heart? Well, James obviously thought it was important to write about this because people of that day was having a problem with it. And people of this day are having a problem with it, too. So human beings have a problem with it. It is so important that it is written a lot about in Scripture. We put the value of our worth and people's worth on what is seen. We get things into our hearts through what we see, what we think. Again, our thoughts and things that we let influence our thoughts and our actions, which translate into what we ultimately believe. It's really just a checkpoint for us today, you know, of how we do think and perceive others and how we act towards them. Deciding to follow Jesus is a decision to abide by his ways. It's not an option. Jesus wasn't shiny in appearance, right? By any stretch of the imagination when we read through scripture. He didn't have a shiny home. He didn't have shiny things. What Jesus did based on his relationship with God and his beliefs is what made him shiny. His actions. And the results of his actions outshined everything. Think about the ultimate results of Jesus' actions. The shine of his actions have reached into the future to us today and will continue to reach into the future of human beings and their worth until he ultimately returns for us. And then we'll really know our worth to him. Not that we don't already, that he came and hung on the cross and bled for us. God valued us so much that he sent Jesus to shine and show us our human worth. So God puts the ultimate value on it. When he says in verse 9, there in James 2, that you show partiality or favoritism, you are committing a sin and will be convicted by the law as transgressors. That's pretty hefty, isn't it? That's very important to note that. He goes on to say in verse 10, for he whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point is guilty of it all. One thing. 
guilty of it all. But if you simply do what verse 8 says, love your neighbor as yourself, you will do well. It really just boils down to that, love your neighbor. We hear that a lot, but do we really do it? Do we take it to heart? I always talk about God's economy, which is backwards from the world's economy. And James tells us in verse 5, God chose the poor of the world to be rich in faith. He chose to be rich in faith who is poor in the world, and heirs of the kingdom. His promise was to those who loved him. Wow, that sounds really very shiny to me. I love God. I love God with all my heart. And what I see here is the kingdom, the promises, is for those that love him. Sometimes I think we glaze over some of these things like, oh, God loves everybody. Well, yes, he does love everybody. But his promises, the things that are true, the things for his people that follow him are for those that love him. God chose me and he gave me faith. He talks about giving faith to the ones that he chose. That gives me worth. That gives me self-worth. That gives me worth in the kingdom of God. But it also does for everyone else that's around me, no matter what I think of them or what I perceive their actions to be or the judgments that I come up with. So when God's way is to love my neighbor, I have found the only real way to do that is to pray and ask him to help me see others as he sees them. Because I don't think in our humanness that we really are capable of doing this to the degree that God is asking us to do it. So truly, I have done that often. I pray and ask God, let me see them as you see them. Because how I see them, I'm not going to act very nicely to them. And I'm not going to have very good thoughts. I'm not even going to notice them, you know. And that, again, when you ask God for his heart and what his heart is, he answers it every time. And he'll answer it in such amazing ways that you'll just be, your breath will be taken away. I can preach this message, it's easy to read the scripture and translate it into a message, but to live it, I have to struggle with it as well as everybody else. Love your neighbor as yourself. So who is our neighbor? Is it the ones just living right beside us? Well, I think most all of us live here in the country, right? So we live in the middle of the woods. Most of you know where our house is, so we don't have houses right up against us. So do I have any neighbors? I consider you all my neighbor. I mean, when you're country people, you know, if you'd ask somebody that in the city, it's like, oh, yeah, it's these people on my street. Well, for us, it's the whole neighbor, you know, the whole town. That's the way I look at it. It's the whole county. The neighbor is really the people that we live with, not just the people we live around. So since... It is everybody and encompasses all people. The next tricky part is in this scripture is it says, as you love yourself. To me, that's almost harder than loving others. I, I haven't been the nicest person in the world, actually, through my whole 58 years. Loving yourself isn't always easy. It hasn't been easy for me, but it's important because how can we love as God loved if we don't love ourselves? It all boils down to how much God loves us and wants us to love ourselves <clears throat> and others in that way. So again, we need God's perspective. We need to ask God how he sees us through his eyes. How does he see me? How do you see me, Jesus? John 13, 34, I give you a new commandment. Love one another just as I have loved you. You must also love one another. So there, to me, is a little bit of the answer, how he has loved us. It's only through his love and how he loves us that we can love others. So what can we do? Is loving others always doing big, outrageous things? It can be, but I simply think that it is also the day-to-day -day simple things. You know, maybe it's just a smile at sheets. Maybe it's helping them pump their gas. You know, just start with those simple things. I, I, I'm speaking to myself because I always have this crazy busy life. I don't know why I have these problems, obsessions with just doing, doing, doing. I can just get so focused on doing the next thing I got to get to the next thing. I have these big things I'm doing that I miss the moments around me, you know, to stop and just say hello to a neighbor or help them in some way or, you know, just simple things. Let's just start with simple things. Let's don't feel like we have to go out and change the world, but... Honestly, the simple things added up together will change the world, right? 
1 John 3.18, Dear children, let's not merely say that we love each other. Let us show truth by our actions. So it is the doing, right? It's the doing of the word. Embrace your own worth when you're loving yourself. Realize what you are worth. Don't let others put you down by how they see you or treat you. When we truly get in our being how God sees us, I think that changes us as well as being able to see worth in others because I realize if he can love stinky old me, he loves others too, you know? He loves them just as much as he loves me. So no matter what clothes we have on or the house we live in or the job we have, we should hold our heads up high. We should have the presence of God. When we enter a place, when we are Jesus followers, we're bringing Jesus' spirit in. That in itself should let us lift our head high and put our shoulders back and walk with confidence, with God's confidence. That, I think, will make a difference in how we perceive ourselves and perceive others as well. To me, that is actually an act of worship, having that kind of mindset and acknowledging God in that way in our life. We're giving God glory for his creation. We are his creation. We're all human, aren't we? Every human life is worth the same and worth saving. That was actually said by J.K. Rowling from Harry Potter. So the last thing we see in this scripture we don't want to overlook is mercy. We cannot miss the severity of verse 12 and 13. Mercy is not given to those that judge. You are judged by God in the same way that you judge. That makes me gasp a little bit. <laughs> makes me stop and think, where have I judged? Okay, Jackie, where have you not had those good thoughts? You know, sometimes it really is just in passing because you can think, I don't think that way. I haven't had those thoughts. Oh, but then, well, yeah, there was that one time, right? And again, that other time. And so when we take time to think about it, we may be falling into this trap more than what we think. Actually, the law brings freedom in that when we follow it and do what it says, we will be in the light of God and we will be shiny. So when we follow his laws, these laws are not impressed upon us to oppress us and put us down, but they're given to us to lift us up and help us be who God has created us to be. Mercy triumphs judgment. I know that I need mercy and I pray to be able to give mercy as well. The Lord tells us in many verses in scripture that he makes his face shine upon us. If his face is shining upon us, I would venture to say we're pretty shiny, right? And his face shines upon all those other people that we live with as well. I love to feel the warmth of the sun actually on my face. If, you know, especially after it's been a long period of dreary and cold and it don't even have to be hot in the middle of summer, but just feeling that warmth of the sun. Sometimes I just stop for a minute and, you know, put my face up and just let it actually a few minutes just warm my face. And to me, that is God shining on us. That is the way he shines on us. So why don't we make this very practical and start today by even just making some lists of things that we can do in our daily lives, just us simply. And then we can think about it as a church and as a community. How can we treat others and raise the value of the human worth in the areas we live? We can definitely make a difference in the world. So it's just a simple message, but that simple message could really change the world we live in. I even wore my t-shirt today, and it's, this quote comes out of Matthew 22, 39, and it made me just think, well, how many times do we see this in Scripture, love your neighbors as yourself? What I saw was 12 times. If something is even mentioned twice in Scripture, we need to take notice, but 12 times in Scripture, it tells us, love your neighbors as yourself. So how important do you think it is? It is very important to have this as one of our foundations of life, human worth. And I hope that we can show others what God thinks they are worth, just through our actions and through our prayers and through how we live. So let us follow the word of the Lord this morning. Thank you for letting us share our worship service with you today. We invite you to join us in person next Sunday at 1030, or if you prefer, to listen online Sunday afternoon. 
If you would like to make a donation, please visit our website at www.marionpress.org and click the Donate Now button. May God bless you and have a great week.